So today is going to be a pretty wild one because we're going to look at lots of extremely interesting categories. We've already talked about this category set which has objects representing sets and arrows representing functions between sets. And we're going to see that other kinds of mathematical objects also naturally live in categories. For example, there's going to be a category of graphs, of directed networks. So the objects there are going to be graphs, all graphs represented. And there's going to be some arrows, um, natural sort of ways that we can um, compare these graphs. And there's lots of other very important categories which basically consist of these infinite families of mathematical objects. There's a category of monoids, there's a category, well there's, there's many of them and we're going to discuss some today. But I think maybe the best thing that we're going to do is we're going to discuss this notion of a functor. So just like a function can be used to compare two sets, a functor can be used to compare two categories. And it's basically maybe the second most important definition in category theory after the notion of a category itself. And essentially, this allows us to get to like maybe one of the most mind blowing ideas in category theory, which is the notion that there is a category of categories. So we can have a category where every object represents a category and we have these functors which I'm going to define as the arrows. So this really lifts us up to a whole new level of abstraction. I mean um, it's like it's pretty crazy uh, thinking about this category set which has um, every object in it represents a set and you know that's an immense structure anyway but from the perspective, from this new perspective, um, that's just a category. So that's just going to be an object in this category of categories. So we're going to get there and we're going to discuss that. Um, we're also going to talk about the idea of isomorphism. So if you have two mathematical objects which are similar looking, how do you know that? And how do you use category theory to understand that? For example, if you have two sets which have the same number of elements, um, can we express that in categorical terms? That's what we're going to do. Okay, so a lot of objects in mathematics can be thought of as structured sets. So we've already talked quite a lot about sets and how to think of them in terms of category theory. So let's now think about some other kinds of objects. So, for example, a directed graph, also known as a directed network, is a set of vertices, but there's some extra structure. In particular, we have arrows from one vertex to another, and they can be thought of as extra structure which we kind of impose onto the set. In particular, we can represent these arrows as pairs of vertices, okay? So we have this set of elements, this set of vertices, and then we also have some extra information. We, ha we have a sort of, we can say, well, one is paired with two, three is paired with two, and so on. So we have this set plus extra structure, a structured set. And then we can do the same trick as we did before. We can say, well, what about all graphs? What about all directed graphs? Um, we can think of those as objects in a big category, but then we have to think of some kind of arrows to have between those objects. And a natural choice is going to be functions between these sets, between these vertex sets, which preserve the structure which we have. So in this case, the structure is these edges, these um, directed edges that we have in our graphs. And so we're going to define a type of 
function, a special kind of function, which respects the graph structure. And that's called a graph homomorphism. Mathematicians, for some reason, um, like to use this word morphism sometimes instead of the word arrow. Personally, I prefer the word arrow because it's clear, more clear what it means uh, when, when you first hear about it. Anyhow, um, these graph homomorphisms are functions which preserve the graph structure and the exact definition is that it's a function from the vertex set of one graph to the vertex set of another graph, which has the property that if u is linked to v, in the original graph, then the image of u should be linked to the image of v. So this forms another category and these definitions which we're talking about can all be applied um, equally well to this category of graphs um, as they can to this category of sets <clears throat> which we've been discussing. Another important um, category is the category of monoids. So remember, a monoid um, can be thought of as a category which just has one object. So let's call this object A. And there's going to be this identity arrow, IDA. And this monoid may have more arrows as well, uh, going from this object to itself. And we can compose those arrows with each other. And it's really in this arrow composition that the interesting things in monoids happen. Um, this isn't, so this isn't usually the way that mathematicians think about monoids. Usually they think of a monoid as a sort of structured set so um, the elements would be corresponding to arrows in, in our point of view. But, um, you know, normally they'd think, for example, an example of the monoid would be where the elements in the set are the whole numbers. And we can, we have some kind of operation that we can do on a pair of elements in our set, which gives us another one. For example, addition. So they'd say, oh, well, that's an example of a monoid. So this is another type of structured set that we can have. We can have some kind of set with some kind of operation by which we can take a pair of elements and produce a new one. And that's another kind of structured set. And again, we can come up with a good idea of what should be considered an arrow for those kind of objects. We can make a category of monoids where the arrows are functions which respect this kind of structure of this operation. I'm going to define the category of monoids properly later. Okay, so now I want to introduce this idea of an isomorphism, and that's a special kind of arrow that can be in a category. And when there's an isomorphism from one object to another, in some sense, it means that the first object kind of looks the same as the second one. So before I get into that, I just want to recap a little bit about what we did last time um, to do with this terminal object or final object. So we're talking about this category set which has objects as sets and arrows as functions. So this category set has a, what's called a final object or a terminal object. And that's an object which has the property that for any object, there's just going to be one arrow into it. And Recall that the terminal objects in this category set are just singleton sets, okay? Um, so from this set here, there's just going to be one mapping. 
into this singleton set, similarly here, there's just one mapping. But the interesting thing is that from this singleton set to this set, there are two mappings. Mapping is just another word for function, okay? Um, and similarly, there are three mappings to this set here. Okay, so this is very nice because we're essentially able to identify these sets by <clears throat> how many arrows they have uh, coming into them from this terminal object. Now this is what it looks like when we're allowed to look inside these objects, but in this category set, what the picture really looks like is this. And we also have these identity arrows, but I'm not going to draw those, okay? So the remarkable thing, as I was discussing last time, is that we can basically say things about what these objects represent uh, just by looking at the arrows. And sometimes we have to think about the composition of which arrows make which arrows. But nevertheless, really we can get the information um, from just looking at the relationships between these objects. And now we're going to define this idea of isomorphism. And we're going to do pretty much exactly the same trick. So let's suppose you have a set here with two elements, true and false. And here's another set. This has two elements, one and two. So let's call this set capital A and this one capital B. Well, we can ask, how do we know that these two sets are the same size? How do we know that they look the same? How do we know that one set can be obtained by relabeling the other one? Well, the presence of certain functions between them indicates this. So in particular, there's going to be a function like this, which is what's called a one-to-one -one mapping from this set onto this set. It's called one-to-one -one because it doesn't send distinct elements to the same element and it's called onto because it covers the whole set that is the target okay um, and that is an isomorphism so the important thing about this function is that there's another function which undoes it And that property of it having a sort of inverse is what makes it an isomorphism. Okay, so the important thing then is that if we compose these functions together, so if we do F and then we do G, the result doesn't change anything. So the composition of F followed by G is the identity arrow of this. So it's the identity function, it just sends everything to itself. 
Okay then. And similarly, um, if we go from here and we apply G and then we apply F, the result is just the identity function happening on this set B. And that is the full definition of the isomorphism in the categorical terms. So in terms of category theory, this picture looks like this. So we're going to do our trick again. We're going to take this thing that's happening in set theory and we're going to express it in categorical terms. So we're going to get a, a definition of what an isomorphism is for um, between objects in any category. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that an arrow F is going to be called an isomorphism if there's another arrow, G, which goes in the opposite direction. And we have the property that if we start here and we do F and then G, we compose them, the result is the identity arrow on A. And similarly, if we start at B and then we go along G and then along F and we compose them, then the result is the identity arrow on B. And you can see that that same thing is what's happening in set theory. Indeed, we just looked at what was happening in set theory and just lifted the, um, just translated what was going on into category theory terms. But it turns out that this is very fruitful because this same definition of isomorphism can be applied to loads of other categories and it usually gives quite sensible results. So for example, if we think about this other category of directed graphs, the objects are directed graphs and we have these homomorphisms as arrows, then if we just use this same definition, um, we get that this does indeed tell us that, you know, if we just apply this same definition, we find that it makes a lot of sense because in this case, um, an isomorphism is a special kind of function that sends the vertices on one graph to the vertices of another graph, which is essentially just relabeling the vertices. It, it preserves the graph structure exactly. So when we use this definition in the category of graphs, it's called a, a graph isomorphism. An isomorphic graph, so it's basically just the same structure, but perhaps labeled differently. And we can use this idea of isomorphism to understand more about what's going on in category theory as well. So recall that a terminal object is an object that just has one incoming arrow from every other object. Well, we've already seen that this is an important definition in category theory. But what happens if there are multiple terminal objects? There may well be. I mean, if I mean, if this notion of being a terminal object is so important, then um, if there's multiple ones, how do we know? So if it's important to focus on a terminal object in order to build some definition in category theory, then how do we know which one we should pick? Should we focus on this one or should we focus on this one? Well. The thing is that it turns out that any two terminal objects are isomorphic. And you can see that in a quite straightforward way because we know that there's just one incoming arrow um, into this terminal object from any other object. And similarly, there's just one incoming arrow 
from this terminal object, from any object. So if we, that means there's going to be arrows between them. This one here and this one here. Now what happens if we compose those arrows together? Well, if we compose this arrow with this arrow, that must result in some arrow which starts at this object here and goes back to itself. But there's only one such arrow because it's a terminal object, that's the definition. And we also know that because this is a category, this has to have an arrow, which is the identity arrow. So we know that composing this with this makes some arrow from itself to itself. We know that there's only one, and we know that it has an identity arrow. So that means that composing this with this must be the identity arrow similarly for here. So it turns out that these arrows between terminal objects are isomorphisms. So what that means, for example, in set theory is that the only terminal objects are these singleton sets. Okay, now we've had a look at lots of categories. It's time to talk about how to compare them. It maybe isn't too much of a stretch to say that a category really is the sort of quintessential representation of structure or pattern. I mean, whenever you have a structure or a pattern, very often somehow a category represents it. And a functor, if you buy this metaphor, then a, a functor is um, really a sort of, it's the basic idea of pattern recognition. Okay, how do you see one pattern inside another? And essentially, it just corresponds to a sort of mapping, a sort of function, um, sending the objects and arrows in one category to the objects and arrows in another category, which preserves structure. Okay, so now it's time to define maybe the second most important notion in category theory and that's the idea of a functor from one category to another. So a function goes from one set to another. A functor goes from one category to another and it preserves the structure of the category. Okay so I'll start with an example. Here we have a category C and a category D and I want to illustrate a functor which goes from this category to this category. So a category consists of objects and arrows. So a functor is really two functions, one that sends the objects in this category to the objects in this category, and another one that sends the arrows in C to the arrows in D. And <clears throat> so what we're defining here is A functor f from categories from a category C to a category D. So the first part of the idea is there's going to be a function that sends the arrow the objects of C to the objects of D. So let's let's draw that in. So then the image of A under this map we'll, we'll call FA. This is going to be F of B. And this is going to be F of C. Now the second part of the definition is we want to send the arrows of C to the arrows of D. But we want to do that in such a way that the source and destination of arrows is preserved and also the composition is preserved. Okay, so for example, we'd want to send this arrow F here to this arrow here. 
which we can call capital F of F. So let's start to write down the definition of a functor. So firstly we're saying that it sends objects in C to objects in D and we're denoting the image of an object A as capital F of A. Okay, then the second thing we're saying is that the image of an arrow, which we're also um, using this capital F, so we're sort of overloading the usage of capital F, but that's just um, more convenient. But anyway, um, the image, capital F of this arrow F, is going to be an arrow in D, and it's going to start at the image of the source of f and it's going to end at the image of the destination of f so in a way the sort of source and destination of these arrows has got preserved and we also want composition to be preserved so we have this extra condition i mean um think about this arrow in category C. This is the composition of F and the composition of G. So where do we want this to get sent to in category D? Well, we want it to get sent to the composition of where F got sent to and where G got sent to. Okay. So we can write this by saying that F of G, so the image of arrow G after the image of arrow F in this category D better be equal to f of g after f for any composable arrows g and f. So what we're basically saying here is that the composition of the image of arrows is the image of the composition of the arrows. One more condition, my simple one, is that we want the functor to preserve these identity arrows. So the final thing we need is that f of id a is equal to id of f of a. So for example we want to be sending, well we want to send each identity arrow um, of A to the identity arrow of F of A. So if you think about it a bit, this really is the kind of natural way you'd want to define a functor. And there's going to be lots of functors in category theory and they're very useful notions, extremely useful. And I mean, this functor here, notice that it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't send things to everything in this category D. Nothing gets sent to these, um, these objects and arrows over here, and that's okay. It just has to be, just like a function doesn't have to cover all of its target set, these functors don't have to cover all of the target category. And similarly, uh, functions can send... Um, things to like distinct things to the same thing and so can functors okay so an extreme example of this consider this category here that just has one object and an identity arrow well there's a functor from c to this category here where we simply collapse everything down so we send every object to this object here and we send every arrow 
this identity arrow, etc. Um, and that's going to be a properly defined functor. So functors really give you the main way to compare categories. So the thing is with functors, they also act like arrows in a category where the objects themselves are categories. So we can compose functors together. So I have three categories here. I haven't drawn the identity arrows. And we should have a, we can have a functor like this, and then there will be another functor like this. And so if we call this one F and this one G, then we can compose those together just by composing the maps. And we get that G after F is going to be a functor from this category on the left to this category on the right. So we can compose our functors and we can show that this functor composition is associative. And we also have a kind of identity arrow, uh, a functor where we just send every object to itself and every arrow to itself. OK, so now it's time for a really wild idea. We've seen that there are these uh, large scale structures. You have this one set that represents what's going on in set theory. You have one that represents what's going on in graph theory. Uh, there's a category of monoids, um, which represents what's going on to do with monoids. And now we're going to think of each of those immense structures as a little object in a new category, a category of categories. So in this category, the objects are categories and the arrows are functors um, because you can compose functors together, they're associative, and we have identity functors that just send every object to themselves and every arrow to themselves. And so we have a category of categories and this has a special name. It's usually called cat. And it really is an extremely interesting thing to think about, in my opinion. Um, I mean, a lot of what's going on in mathematics can be thought of in terms of sort of wandering around in sets. But this is like a whole nother level of abstraction above that, because this is, you know, thinking about this category cats, we have all the different categories. Um, so that we and we can think about how to go between them and how they're related to each other and all the rest of it. So, yeah, I think this is an interesting idea. Um, I should say that in addition to this thing having objects and functors, there's also something else in this category. Um, well, there's something else in this structure. It's actually more than just a regular category because there are also things called natural transformations, which I'm going to introduce later. Essentially, um, a natural transformation would be a, a sort of arrow between parallel functors. OK, um, but I'm going to discuss that later. But you don't need to know about that to appreciate this structure. I mean, it's um, you can think about it now. You have the um, you know about what categories are and what functors are. And yeah, it's a very interesting thing. OK, so now we know about functors, I can properly define another couple of interesting categories of structured sets. So one of them is called mon. And the objects in mon are monoids. So normally when people talk about monoids, they, um, 
they give this kind of set theoretic definition that oh you know we have a set and we have an operation that takes a pair of elements and makes another element and it's associative and it has identity elements but we don't really need to talk about that because we know category theory so we can just think of a monoid as a category of one object so we have lots of different monoids let's say all the different monoids and these are our objects now in this category mon and then the arrows between these monoids are functors and that's the definition of a um, this monoid category if you look up this definition of what people consider to be a monoid morphism, it's nothing more than a, a functor defined on this type of thing. It sends this single object to a single object, and it sends these self-looped arrows, which we think of as our elements in the monoid, to self-looped arrows in the other category. And it preserves composition, and it sends the identity arrow to the identity arrow. So that's, um, that's a, this category mon. Okay, so another one of these big, large scale categories that we can define is called pre. And this one has pre-ordered sets as objects. And it has some arrows which preserve the structure of those. So a pre-ordered set, I gave a definition of them in the previous um, in the previous in a previous video um, but essentially an equivalent definition is it's just a category where you don't have any parallel arrows and it turns out that the natural type of morphism people think of between um, pre-ordered sets this kind of structure preserving map the arrows um, again just correspond to functors Okay, so this category pre-order has the pre-orders as objects and functors as arrows. Okay, so a functor like this, sorry, I mean an arrow like this from this pre-ordered set to this pre-ordered set sends the objects in here to the objects in here. And normally, when most people think about pre-ordered sets, they would express that there's an arrow from A to B by writing A less than or equal to B. We don't do that so much because we like to think of things in terms of arrows and categories and so on. But, um, you know, an equivalent way to define these type of arrows is to say that when A is less than or equal to B, we want our functor f, our, sorry, our arrow f to be a functor or to be a, if we like, we can think of it as a map from these objects to these objects such that when a is less than or equal to b, we have f of a is less than or equal to f of b. Which is just a fancy way of saying that it preserves the source and destination of the arrows in this pre-ordered set. And indeed, that's all we have to do when we're comparing pre-ordered sets, because when there's no parallel arrows, it doesn't really matter what the composition of what arrow is with what, because, you know, there's only there's only one arrow, say, from A to C. So we know that's automatically the composition of the arrow from A to B and the arrow of B to C. We don't have to worry about saying specifically, you know, giving these arrows labels and saying, oh, you know, this one is the composition of this one and this one, because if we know this is a pre-ordered set, then that has to be that. Okay, so I've actually, I want to say more about the definition of functors, because I've actually only told you half of the story, in a way. There's another type of functor I have to tell you about. Um, it's not a lot more detail, but it is important. So um, the critical thing is that if we have any category, we can just reverse the directions of all of the arrows and we get another category. That's called 
the opposite. So we naturally have this type of duality happening in category theory. And the type of functor I've told you about so far is called a covariant functor. It preserves the direction of arrows. So if we have a, a category like this, then this type of functor I've already told you about, this so-called, it's actually called a covariant functor, would look something like this, might look something like this. obviously sends the objects to objects and it sends an arrow F to the arrow which goes between the image of its source and the image of its destination. So these covariant functors are characterized by saying that um, if, if f is a covariant functor, then f of f is going to go from f of a to f of b. That's the image of an arrow in this original category that goes from a to b. And we also have this property that f of the composition of a pair of arrows will be the composition of f of that pair. The image of the composition is the composition of the images. Um, now, a contravariant functor is the same kind of idea but we reverse the arrow directions okay so we still send the identity arrows to identity arrows but the difference for these contravariant functors there's two differences one difference is that f of this arrow F is going to go from its destination, the image of its destination, to the image of its source. And also, we now have to sort of reverse the order of composition because we want this thing here now to get sent to this thing here. And this is obtained by composing in the other direction. So we want now f of g after f to equal f of f after f of g. So this defines a so-called contravariant functor. So this arrow here is going to get sent to this arrow here. The objects are still going to get mapped in the same way. Um, it's just that we're reversing the directions of the arrows, okay? And so, yeah, we have these two different types of functors. Um, when someone doesn't say, they're usually talking about a covariant functor. I've been talking about covariant functors all the time today. Okay, so I just want to add a couple of footnotes so that this is more logically consistent. I wanted to say is about the sort of size of these categories and things. I mean, 
I've purposefully been playing a little bit silly with the um, terminology. I've been referring to things as sets, which may be actually larger than sets. Um, and I've just been doing that because I wanted to sort of sidestep this, um, this extra complication of saying, well, okay, so the collection of all sets, is that a set? Uh, no, it's not a set. <clears throat> it's something sort of larger than a set. Um, basically, to define things properly, you define a sort of universe of sets that you're interested in, and that's a universe of sets, and every set in that universe um, is a um, is an object in this category set. And that universe itself is not a set. It's something. It's something greater than that. Um, and similarly, so we'll say a category is small when it does actually have when it when the collection of objects it has is actually a set. And all these little categories I've been drawing are small. Um, if you had a category that has an object for every natural number, that's small because. The set of natural numbers is just a set, of course. Um, but when you start talking about the collection of all sets or the collection of all graphs or the collection of all monoids or the collection of all categories, those collections are not technically sets. They're, they're um, something greater. So you call such categories large categories. 